Hello, everyone. Um, good evening. Wonderful to see so many of you here. Um, well done for getting your hands on a very coveted ticket. I understand it was a sellout, uh, but welcome to, of course, to the people who are joining from home. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you on behalf of the Conduit Club and the How To Academy. Uh, and may I congratulate them on an uh, uncanny coinciding of this event <laughs> with perhaps the most historical day in, our, in politics for a very long time. Um, but we are not here to talk just about that, or it is all connected. <laughs> it, it's all connected, it's all politics, but we are here to talk about something that is um, enormously important to most, if not all, of our lives, which is, of course, the NHS. Um, and that's what the book uh, that the event is uh, inspired by is based on, Zero, Eliminating Unnecessary Deaths in a Post-Pandemic NHS, which is full of... Um, quite a few heartbreaking accounts, um, a number of failures and care failures, but also ways to deal with that, um, uh, yeah, how we can get through it, which is perhaps the most important part. Um, I'm sure you all know our guest this evening. He is the author of the book. He is, uh, as we were just told, the longest serving health secretary from 2012 to 2018, um, the MP for Surrey West, and of course now he sits on the Health and Social Affairs Select Committee. Thank you so much indeed for being here, Jeremy. I'm quite amazed actually that you are. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Only just what well, today's been quite a day. How's it been for you? Uh, it's been uh, just another day in British politics, uh, <laughs> of course, and, uh, you know, it's uh, one of those days where um, if you're not standing for the leadership of the Conservative Party, you're very much in a very small minority amongst Conservative MPs, so uh, uh, it's a day when uh, everyone is, uh, what's the word that's used in Westminster, taking soundings, um, but um, look, I, we're going to talk about the NHS, but Let's talk about the elephant in the room, which is the big news today. Um, I think it is um, very important that today happened uh, because there was a breach of trust between government and people, and we need to restore that. And, um, you know, what has been striking for me over um, the last couple of months is how many left wing friends who do not support the Conservatives who might have wanted to say, please keep Boris Johnson because that will give us a better chance of a Labour government, say, no, it, it has to change because it's our country. There's another two years for an election and we now have to rebuild that trust and that's going to be a very big and difficult challenge. And I think that uh, if I think, you know, of political leaders with whom many people will disagree with what they stood for and what they did, you think of Margaret Thatcher and the big changes uh, in the 1980s. You think of David Cameron and George Osborne with austerity. Uh, you can think of those changes, but you never, you can think of Theresa May and some of the decisions over Brexit. You never doubted the integrity or sincerity of the Prime Minister in that. And rightly or wrongly, and I don't think we want to go into those, I think people did have those question marks and they had to be resolved. And so that's why I think today is, is an important change for the country. You sort of addressed the elephant in the room, <laughs> but not quite, because I think everybody obviously wants to know whether you still intend to put your hat in the ring. You said pretty much any, only us in this room or all Conservative MPs do, so I'm assuming that's yes. Um, well, I think uh, it's, no, it's no secret that I, um, I'm minded to be where I think the majority of Conservative MPs will probably be, um, but um, uh, I'm afraid this is not the occasion that I'm going to officially <laughs> uh, give you the answer to that. And I do want to talk to my colleagues, and things change, and I, you know, um, so lots of those things are, are happening. Um, uh, but uh, the answer is that, you know, I, it's not a secret that I... Um, uh, I'm seriously considering the possibility of joining 350 Conservative MPs in that uh, contest. Uh, just, just, obvious, just one, one more thing on that, which is just there is a sense of confusion. You, you know, you talk in the book, so about the book, about the experience you have of the well-oiled choreography of British government reshuffles. We are so far from that, and none of us really understand what's going on. Is he going to stay until he says he will? Well, we have a um, 
We have a Prime Minister who specialises in uh, breaking the rules that have been uh, around for a long time, and that's what I think has created some of the uncertainty. But there is now a very clear process. Um, and, you know, the MPs, Conservative MPs, whittle it down to two people. That uh, couldn't happen. Last time it took three weeks from this moment for that to happen. Uh, I think this time it's entirely possible it'll happen in two weeks because Parliament breaks for summer recess in two weeks. The members stage, when Conservative Party members vote on the final two, last time it took five weeks. Um, so, but then the time before, uh, when Theresa May became Prime Minister, that didn't happen at all because the person who came second decided to fold in behind the person who, who came top. So these things can happen pretty quickly. You do write about leadership in the book with reference to what you learnt about leaders through working with the NHS. And you say, rather than force of nature types who bend people to their will, the more effective leaders tend to be more modest, big ears, big eyes and small mouth. Does that work in politics too? Um, not always, um, but it was really interesting. So one of the things that I did, and I'm, you can't write a book like this about the future of the NHS without being honest about the things you got wrong, and I'm, I will do that. Um, although it's a subjective book, so you know it was going to come from my point of view. But one, but if you ask me the sort of one of the two or three things I was most proud of, one of them was that I introduced the Ofsted rating system that we have for schools for hospitals. We'd never had that before because we had mid staffs, and I said, how do we know if there's another mid staffs around the corner? And they said, we don't. And I said, well we've got to have a way of doing that. And so after a lot of debate, we have become the only health system in the world which rates every hospital outstanding, good, requires improvement, uh, poor. I like the Ofsted system. I think it's good for parents. Um, it's good for, good for schools, although they curse it. But everyone knows where they stand. When we introduced that system, one of the great surprises and I'm, I'm delighted we've got a very distinguished uh, former health secretary, Virginia Bottomley, at the back, and she, I think, would probably say the same thing, that we found that the hospitals that got outstanding were led by rather quiet people. And there were the chief executives who were the kind of, um, you know, um, I'm trying to find an appropriate way of describing uh, people with big egos, but, um, you know, for a, for a family audience, but, you know... Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, boisterous. The, there were the people that thrust themselves forward and they weren't uh, actually running the best hospitals. And then I read a book uh, by Jim Collins called Good to Great, which tried to look at what is the difference between good organizations and great organizations. And he was looking at American uh, companies listed on the New York stock market. And he said the reason is because modest people attract great teams. Because people who are really capable, they like working for a boss who's going to listen to them and let them shine. Whereas the big sort of Jack Welsh style CEOs tend to attract yes men. And so you end up with a very hollow management team. And I think exactly the same is true in hospitals. Um, you perhaps might explain to the people who haven't uh, read it, the title really, Zero, and, and why you chose to call it that. Yes, I mean, first of all, this is a, a very um, unusual book to write, um, particularly for a Conservative Health Secretary, because you might think you'd be on an absolute hiding for nothing for someone who was a Health Secretary, at times a controversial Health Secretary, to write a book in which every single chapter starts with a horror story of something that's gone very badly wrong in the NHS. Um, I then do say, why is this happening and what the solution, what I think the solution is, um, but um, the, real, the reason I started on this journey was because a few months in, I was, you know, you arrive as health secretary, I knew nothing. I mean, Virginia, well, I won't say that Virginia knew nothing when she became health secretary, but I think most health secretaries are pretty terrified when you take on the fifth largest organization in the world, 1.4 million employees, the largest employer in Europe, and you're surrounded by doctors who've been doing this for their lives, and you're, you're a a politician and they really don't trust you and and I and and the head of the chief executive of the NHS who I had a lot of respect for I grew to have a lot of respect for he said Jeremy you've got to understand that in healthcare we harm 10% of patients in other words we make mistakes that damage and kill people for 10% of patients 
By the way, that's not a UK figure, that's an internationally accepted figure in healthcare systems. So I thought, that's a bit of a surprise. And then I said, well, how many people actually die? And being the good old NHS, we, we have more statistics about our health service than anywhere else. We've actually got academic surveys. There's a survey by Hogan and Black who work at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And they have measured and they say that 4% of hospital deaths have a 50% chance or more of being preventable, which works out at about 150 preventable deaths a week. And um, the problem is that you know, an average size hospital, that's like 50 deaths a month. Sorry, this is a really grim topic for a lovely summer's evening, but <laughs> 50 deaths a month, uh, because half of us die in hospital, the mortuary is pretty busy. Now, one or two of those deaths could have been prevented, but which one or two? No one wants to spend all their time going through all those things when they've got lots of patients who are alive who are waiting to be seen. So we end up kind of accepting it. And so the reason I call the book Zero is because I asked, should we not have the aim of having zero preventable deaths? And then I ask, because everyone said this is the cost of doing business, and then I looked at other industries, and the airline industry is the best industry that has changed its culture. And they used to have a culture, believe it or not, in the 1970s, which also said that it's inevitable we're going to have a few crashes every year. And they decided that they wouldn't have a business if they didn't do something about that. And they basically moved to a no blame. They used to fire pilots who made mistakes, we still fire doctors who make mistakes. And they said, we can't do that, because if we do that, they'll cover up the mistakes, and we won't be able to learn from them. Now, the airline industry got the number, and so, and in, since the 1970s, uh, the number of deaths has gone down by two thirds, um, and the number of people flying has increased by nine times. So it's become massively safer to fly as a result of those changes. And amazingly, in 2017, they got down to zero passenger deaths across the whole world in the airline industry. So they got to zero. Unfortunately, then we had the Boeing Max jet crashes and it went up. So you can never be complacent. But I put that title in there as a kind of challenge. So it's a very long answer. Um, no, but... I mean, you ended on a positive note, I was going to say, on the balmy evening. But there is a positive... Uh... Un what underlies the book is positive because you're saying that this should be a 1948 moment. I'm wary you will wrote it before cost of living crisis that we're in now, perhaps war the war in Ukraine, and we're in a really difficult place. Do you still have that optimism that we can seize a 1948 moment, as you call it? I'll, I'll be honest. I am really worried that our NHS agenda is just falling back on a discussion about money. And I do talk about money in the book, and the NHS and the care system need more money, and they're going to carry on needing more money because we're living for longer and new medicines are coming on stream. But we also need to think of reforms. Um, and so the 1948, 1948 was the year the NHS was founded. It's an incredible moment. It was a Labour government that did it. It was a big leap of faith, but it was also period when we were completely bankrupt in this country after the Second World War. Um, and, you know, we were, you know, we were in a very challenging set of circumstances, and yet we found the imagination. And that's what I would like us to do uh, with the NHS. I don't think it's enough to say, you know, 50,000 more nurses, 40 new hospitals, and, you know, a health and care levy, and that's it, tick in the NHS box. All those things will help, but there needs to be a lot more. And I'll give you one, just one very good example. We spend roughly the same proportion of our GDP on health as France or Germany, but France has 20% more doctors per head. Germany has 60% more doctors per head, which is why you wait longer to see a doctor in this country. And why is that? It's because we spend £6 billion every year on locum doctors and agency nurses at huge expense rather than training enough doctors in the first place. So just before we come back to some of those, because essentially you do go through the various things that are going wrong and then the various ways in which we can change it, but um, I, I wonder if you could explain to people about 
your letters, which really uh, form the backbone of the narrative and the many, as you called them, horror stories that we hear. Well, I, you know, I went on this journey in a very, a very unusual way um, because about, well, five months after I became health secretary, um, and I was, I suppose I was kind of looking for a cause. I was thinking, what's, can't change everything. What's the big thing I'm going to try and change, which turned out to be patient safety. And I went to Margaret Thatcher's funeral and um, it was, you know, nothing to do with the NHS. It was a most extraordinary occasion. It was a, you know, it was, I felt, you know, as we sang I Vow to Thee, My Country, I thought this is probably the most British moment you could ever imagine. Um, and the Bishop of London gave the eulogy, and in his eulogy, he read out a letter that Margaret Thatcher had written as Prime Minister to an 11-year-old boy, which was amusing. And I listened to that, and I thought, in my five months as health secretary, I have not seen a single letter from a member of the public, not one. So I went back and they said, and, they, and I asked my officials, who were brilliant people, but they said, yes, well, we get more letters than anywhere else except number 10 Downing Street in this department. We have a team of 150 people whose job it is to reply to them so that you don't have to, Secretary of State. Um, and I said, well, that's, that's great, but I think I would like to, I'd like you to choose one a day that I can see and personally reply to. And I'll make that the first thing I do every day, just so that I'm a little bit in touch with what's going on. And nothing happened. And uh, I, I discovered that uh, there'd been meetings set up behind the scenes as to how can we dissuade <laughs> the Secretary of State from this terrible idea. And then, um, uh, so I chased, and then I got a letter came up and said, uh, uh, dear Secretary of State, we're just writing to say what wonderful service I have from the NHS. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, no, I want to know the problems. And then a really awful letter came about a, a dad whose daughter killed herself. And I wrote, I'm sorry. And it was the day after she had been seen, the daughter had been seen by a mental health nurse who hadn't spotted the risk. So I wrote, I'm truly sorry. And the letter came back saying, I'm sorry, Secretary of State, you can't say sorry. And I actually, for some reason, I knew my law on that. And I, I must have encountered it in another government job that in, in, in our law, it's not a, an admission of liability to say sorry. So you can say sorry. Um, and I, so I, the letter stood. And I started seeing these letters. And they, they sort of framed my day. And they were all awful in different ways, um, but I mean, one of them, uh, you know, a man went in to see his father who had dementia, and he was um, lying in a public ward, naked on top of his bed, with a catheter attached to his private parts, and the son complained and was brushed off by a nurse, so he wrote to the chief executive to complain, and the chief executive didn't reply personally, it was just PP'd by the chief executive's assistant. And so I wrote a, an apology letter, and two hours later, I had a meeting, and I thought, the name of that hospital looks familiar. <laughs> and I realized it was the very same hospital, and they'd come to ask me for some capital funding, the chief executive. <laughs> and I said, while you're here, <laughs> and I have to say that chief executive had the worst meeting of his entire life. And to his credit, he did go around to the house of the person and apologize personally. But anyway, that was my kind of way in as a non-doctor to trying to understand some of the, the problems we are facing. So you can say sorry as a politician. I also take from that. Uh, <laughs> Just because yes. I'm wondering if, you know, well, we didn't hear that word today, I don't think. But I might have missed it. Um, but uh, importantly, you, you, do, you did listen to those people and they sat face to face with you. And, and there are so many stories in the book that are, as I said and you said, very heartbreaking. And you, you say, as health secretary, you're several layers away from what is happening. But ultimately, you are responsible for everything that happens on your watch. Th that must be very difficult. And how you sort of distance yourself from not going home with a great amount of guilt every evening. Yes. And so I think the first thing people say is, well, look... Why didn't you sort out all these problems that you're writing about? It's a perfectly. Do you include three tweets? To yes. Explain yes, that? exactly. And you know, um, I mean, pe people are quite witty on Twitter sometimes. Sometimes they're horrible, but you know, a very typical uh, tweet I would get to some of these stories is, uh, "Gosh, 
Jeremy Hunt's going to be really angry when he finds out who was health secretary for six years during all the time these problems happen. And, you know, so, um, and the truth is that I did make a start. Um, by the end of my time, three million more patients were using good or outstanding hospitals than when I started. And the NHS was much more open. And I think the NHS today really is. There was a culture before. I don't, it's not, you know, just me that's changed. That lots of ethical doctors and nurses and managers really felt the time was right to change this culture. Sir Robert Francis said we had to change it in his report. Um, but the NHS is really good now compared to how it was um, at being open when things go wrong. But um, there, the truth is that there were lots of things that I, I wish I had done, which I didn't do. Um, and so let's just give you those, you know, I did increase the number of medical schools, six new medical schools, increase the number of doctors we train, but I wish I'd actually taken the decision about how many doctors and nurses we train out of the Westminster cycle and given it to, to a kind of independent body to decide. And, and the reason for that is it takes 10 years to train a, a consultant or a GP. And so when a health secretary and a chancellor are negotiating a spending round, it's never a priority for either of them how many doctors we're going to have in 10 years' time. They're not necessarily expecting to be doing that job then. And it costs 250 grand to train one doctor. So it's quite a lot of money. And the result is that we have a sort of market failure. We just continually don't train enough. And I think we need to find a way of knowing that whoever the health secretary is, whoever the chancellor is, whatever colour the, the party is, we are always training enough doctors and nurses for the future. I wish I'd done that. And the second thing I'll say that I wish I'd done is I wish I'd properly got us back to um, the system we had pre-2004 where GPs had individual patient lists and everyone had their own GP rather than being attached to a surgery. The contract changes that were made then were well-intentioned, but we know from evidence produced in Norway last year that if you see the same doctor over a long period of time, you're 30% less likely to go to hospital and 25% less likely to die. Because if you've got a funny cough, a doctor who knows you is more likely to say, I'm worried about that let's go and check it's not lung cancer or whatever. And I, just, I did try and change it back. I didn't succeed. And if there's one thing that would make a real difference to the safety of care in the NHS, it would be that. The continuity point, which you talk about in the book, how do we address that? Because as you say, it's a hugely important issue, not just with GPs, but also into hospitals. The continuity, the information that you, they have about each patient, and they have to, so often families, as you say, keep re-giving the information mm. and things get lost along the way, and it's, it's, it's a, a real waste of... Well, it's worse than that. I mean, the frustration that, um, you know, people have is having to give the same information over and over again to a different different team. But but in the, in the book, there's a story about a... Uh, a terrible story about a man who ultimately died because he had terrible diarrhea and uh, it wasn't fixed for 10 months. And the reason it wasn't fixed was because individual doctor after individual doctor said, I think it might be this, I'm going to refer you to an appointment. And then he waits a month or two for the appointment. And then another doctor says, no, it's not this, I'm going to refer you to another appointment. Anyway, it basically took 11 months before he had an operation on his bowels, and by which time it was too late. And that wouldn't have happened if there'd been one doctor who said, I'm in charge of you, and I'm gonna get to the bottom of this. And so it, it does matter. But there's something else that is a structural change. Now, I inherited some very big structural changes from Andrew Lansley, um, which were not very popular. Um, and so, I was very cautious about making any more changes. But I think we have gone mad about targets in the NHS. We have more targets than any other health system in the world. And I'm not against having one or two targets for a big objective, you know, bringing down the COVID backlog or something like that. But a hospital manager I spoke to said that they have over 100 inspections every year um, from different bits of the health bureaucracy. And 
you know, tens if not hundreds of different targets. And I think the problem when you have targets on the scale that we have in the NHS is that in the end, patients become numbers and you lose that link between doctor and patient. And if you talk to Andrew Marr about his stroke, he says, well, he had absolutely brilliant hospital care, but it sort of vanished when he went home and needed aftercare because after he'd had his hospital care that saved his life, that was a tick in the box for the hospital. They got paid for uh, looking after another stroke patient. And then it was someone else's job to do the aftercare and there wasn't a target. And so I just think we've got to rethink our, our very target-centric approach. That linking of things up, that continuity, also covers the huge disconnect between social care and health care, which you reference, and also was struck by the fact that the committee you sit on is, covers both but yet out in the real world, they're so disconnected and that wastes, again, so much time, money. I mean, and there's an example in the book of, you know, lives. Yeah, it's, it's getting better. We are seeing the health and social care system beginning to be joined up in, in parts of the country. Um, but I think the, this is an issue where actually funding really does matter. Um, the My Select Committee, so I negotiated a big rise in the NHS budget I was not successful in doing so for the social care budget. And so one of the first things I did with my committee was ask how much money the social care system actually needs because, you know, we've got more and more older people and, uh, you know, it, it makes no sense at all uh, what we have at the moment where people get stuck in hospitals because there's no care package in the community. A hospital bed is £300 a night. A care home bed is £100 a night. Sending a care around once or twice a day is, is £50 a day. So it's far cheaper to look after people in the community, far nicer. Um, we think that the care system needs about seven... Its budget needs to be increased over a five-year period to by about £7 billion a year, which is a big increase. Not all in one go, but, but gradually. The government's basically gone to about £2 billion a year. So there's a gap there in local authority funding and capability. And while that gap is there, it's going to be difficult to integrate the NHS and care systems because the local NHS, which is also stretched, is going to be worried about the financial liability of, of getting close to a system that is even more stretched than they are. And I do think you have to think of the two systems as one. The way in which all of these problems are brought to light, as the book you know, clearly shows, is by individuals who've become campaigners because they've been through these unimaginable scenarios that you relate. Surely it should be down to them. I know. It's, it's, they, and I, really, I, I wrote the book because of them, because I met... I mean, there's a lady called Melissa Mead who lost her one-year-old baby to sepsis because it, it wasn't spotted in time. And... She has become one of the country's greatest sepsis campaigners, and she came to see me, and she sat opposite me, uh, deeply suspicious of me. She thought, I'm going to be fobbed off by another politician. She plonked William's teddy bear in front of her on the table, and I found out after the meeting that inside that teddy bear were William's ashes, and she was taking these ashes around the media, you know, all her TV interviews, and she, she's an amazing lady. She is reliving the agony of losing William over and over again to increase awareness of sepsis. So thanks to her, on the sides of ambulances today, you see stickers saying, could it be sepsis, to try and raise awareness. Um, she persuaded me to, to fund that. And um, they are so brave. But what you see time and time again, you're right, Hannah, is that we're basically leaning on those people to bang the drum for changes rather than a system. What we need is a system that is hungry to learn those changes itself. And if you continue, as, as not just us, it's all over the world, if you continue to punish... I mean, let me put it this way. You and I make mistakes in our work. The whole, I'm sure you never do, Hannah, but I, 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 I occasionally do. And... No one dies when I make a mistake in my line of work. I give a lousy speech or do a lousy media interview and I'm embarrassed professionally, but no one dies. But doctors and nurses have very bravely chosen to go into a profession where 
the price of a, a mistake could sometimes be a tragedy. And so, you know, I'm not saying that in one, amongst 1.4 million people there won't be the odd bad apple. Of course there will be. But the vast, vast majority are trying to do the right thing. And when they make those human mistakes, the right response is to listen and support them because they are as devastated as the families that something's gone wrong. And they want to learn from that mistake. And then we can avoid that toxic blame culture. Um, and I'm sorry to apologize to any lawyers here this evening, but one of the issues is that lawyers get involved very quickly as well. And that makes everyone very defensive about speaking openly about what's happened. And the single thing that matters most of all is that the tragedy is not repeated. And that's, that doesn't happen. So that's how a conservative gets applause, by criticising <laughs> lawyers. <laughs> I'm going to remember that for next time. <laughs> um, that there's, I mean, uh, that's a huge cultural change. Um, other industries have, have as you, you mentioned, the airline industry perhaps looked at being, becoming more transparent. But you, when you write about the NHS, it comes all the way through the book, this notion that the blame culture is deeply embedded. There's fear all the way through no one really ever wants to own up to anything so how do you change that well and why is it so deeply embedded okay so there's the thing that you can't do from on high which is you need inspiring leaders in hospitals who are open about their own mistakes and create a learning culture and we have got some brilliant hospitals in this country um, Western Sussex run by used to be run until she retired very recently Dame Marianne Griffiths it's got the best learning culture, one of the best learning cultures of any hospital anywhere in the world, actually. It's amazing. Salford Royal, uh, run until recently by Sir David Dalton. Again, a fantastic learning culture. Um, so we do have, and they're generally led by those leaders who make people secure and feel able to talk openly about things that have gone wrong. But there are some things that we could change in the law. So if you, if, if there's a mistake when you're, your child is born and the child ends up with cerebral palsy, um, in order to get compensation, a court has to agree that there was clinical negligence, either by a doctor or by a hospital. And that can take between five and ten years. Now, every single one of us, if we had a child born with cerebral palsy, would be thinking about that child's future and we would want the money, rightly, and so a lawyer would say to us, well, tell us, show us, tell us what happened, and OK, we'll start the process. No doctor wants to be found guilty of clinical negligence. So they fight it, and it takes six or seven years often to resolve this. Now, that, they had that same system in Japan until 2009. And then they changed it, and they said, there's going to be automatic compensation for all severe CP cases. Uh, and we're just going to concentrate on learning what goes wrong. And in the 11 years since 2009, their CP cases have gone down by 25%. Um, and of course, ultimately, that is costing the state far less than our system um, because of the, the blame culture we have. So it's a, you know, it's a very, very important thing to change. You mentioned this in the book, the blame culture is something that people see happening very much when they turn on PMQs or whenever they see politicians, you know, from either side talking particularly about the NHS. It's vitriolic and there's so much blame. So that trickles down. It does. And I, I did ask myself the question, you know, if I'm saying we shouldn't have a blame culture in, in, in medicine, you know, is, does the same apply to politics? And I, I find myself conflicted because the brutality of Prime Minister's questions, um, it, it is theatre and sometimes it is frankly silly, but it's also part of the way that we remind our politicians that politicians are the servants of the people, not the bosses of the people. It's a very raw accountability uh, and I think ultimately it is a good thing in our country. It keeps our politicians' feet on the ground. But I do think that we need space for people to talk about things they've got wrong. Um, I actually 
quite surprised at how willing people have been to accept me talking about the things I got wrong as health secretary in my book. Um, I thought people, I thought there'd be a lot of yaboo after that, and there actually hasn't been. So, um, so I think I think that's a good thing, um, and I think we should allow more space for that. Well, you actually sit down, I think, with your fiercest critic for the book, um, one of the junior doctors. <coughs> Uh, I wonder what you learnt from your conversation with her and also, you know, what perhaps does that, when you look back, feel like a, a moment that you'd rather forget? I think it's certainly a moment I'd rather forget. Um, it, was, it was very, very sad that it happened. And, you know, I often ask myself if I could have avoided it because if you're trying to improve culture in the NHS and deal with all these issues that we've been talking about... You know, 55,000 junior doctors are a very, very important audience for those messages, and they stopped listening to me. And it took me a very long time to uh, mend fences, and I'm sure that people, some people still bruise today. So I was very, very sad that it happened. I think that the changes I wanted in the contract were important to improve cover on Saturdays. If I'm honest, it would it was more important to get more consultants working at the weekends than, than junior doctors. That, that would have made the biggest difference. And I wish I'd focused my energy on changing the consultants contract, not the junior doctor contract. And that remains unchanged to this day. So, you know, I, I, I can look at that. But I think the biggest thing that I learned from that was that sometimes, and I'm afraid in a completely different context, you see this in Ukraine, Sometimes battle lines can get drawn very, very quickly in a way that makes it impossible for either side to retreat. It's, unfortunately, it's very difficult to see a rapid ending to the Ukraine crisis because, because Ukraine is never going to compromise on losing territory and Russia is never going to, or they're going to fight uh, very hard not to give up what they've gained. And in that junior doctor strike, within a matter of weeks, the BMA had balloted for strike action, and I'm afraid to say 98% of junior doctors voted for strike action. But once that happened, it was the, the BMA leadership couldn't negotiate with me because basically they had such a strong mandate and they felt they had to respect that mandate. And so the die was cast, and, and it was a. So I, you know, I learned that advice. I said, you know, try I said to Sajid actually when he was. Health Secretary, try and resolve these issues before it goes to a ballot for strike, if you possibly can, because things can get very hairy after that. And he probably listened, because well, it's the um, one area it's, that... Uh, oh, he's not Health Secretary anymore, so, no. you know... <laughs> I was actually just thinking, do we have one? We do. Steve Buck. Yes, OK, he's still there. Yes. Uh, uh, we'd just better probably check. He might have left while we've been talking. Um, you obviously, in the last year, few years, have spoken up quite a bit about the pandemic and the way that that's been dealt with. And in the book, you talk about groupthink. And you attribute that groupthink to one of the reasons why we might have got things wrong. Yes. I mean, I, I don't think we should... Um, I, I think we should recognise that the NHS and, in fact, ministers worked very hard on pandemic preparations... We did a huge exercise, a three-day exercise called Exercise Cygnus, involving hundreds of people. Um, and we were rated by Johns Hopkins University in America as the second best prepared country for a pandemic in the world. The best prepared was the United States. Um, both those countries had very bad uh, first years of COVID. Um, and the reason was because there was groupthink that if we had a pandemic in this country, it would be a flu-like pandemic because that was the pandemics that we'd had here. And so if you look at the re recommendations and if you look at the report from Exercise Cygnus, um, you, can do, you won't find testing mentioned once, not once. And, you know, that is because flu spreads very quickly, so you don't have that long asymptomatic period which is what is so vicious about covid uh, when you can test people and try and get them to isolate so that was that was the group think and um and i think that it also meant that in the early stages of the pandemic 
we didn't look hard enough at countries like South Korea and places like Taiwan that had um, experience of SARS and ramped up their testing right from the outset. We actually stopped our community testing at a very early stage because we were still thinking in this, uh, about this, this flu-like likelihood of the pandemic. You actually sort of quote Matt Hancock and Dominic Cummings in there as, you know, being, having uh, their doubts but not being able to speak up because of this idea of groupthink. Yes, it's very hard to challenge a very deeply entrenched consensus on how things should be done. And I do, I do recognise that. Um, and I think it's also worth saying that the same people who who got that element of our pandemic handling wrong at the outset, although we did then go for test and trace in a big way, but in the outset we got it wrong, at the very same time as they were getting those decisions wrong, were ordering 400 million doses of vaccines that we didn't know if they worked or not. And we ended up with you know, one of the very best vaccine programs in the world. So it's, that is what is fascinating, how you know, people can make good decisions and bad decisions at exactly the same time. I mean, one of the things that the pandemic did was speed up um, the use of technology you know, in the, in, in the NHS. But you, you write in the book that they're still using faxes. And in so many areas of our lives, we, we, everything's so much easier because of tech and the availability to us. But the NHS does seem to still be incredibly slow. And I should add, of course, there is a balance because, as you say, you know, computers and tech can be a barrier between patients and doctors, and many people want to see a doctor face-to-face. But I'm interested in how you get that balance right. It's really interesting because our, our hospital tech is, is often pretty lousy and it's very frustrating for people who work in hospitals. And our GP tech is amongst the very best in the world. And um, interestingly, that is because um, when Blair did Connecting for Health, um, he, um, he, got, he tried to get the whole NHS signed up and the GPs refused to be part of it. They are legally independent entities. They're legally private businesses, actually. And they said, we don't want anything to do with this. And um, Connecting for Health sort of ended up becoming too huge a project and it basically ended up collapsing and that sort of set us back. The GPs, meanwhile, very quietly got on with the business of putting all our health records uh, onto, into a digital format. They did it very, very quietly. There are two or three different systems they use. They were competing against each other. They're very good systems. All GPs use one of these two or three systems. And um, ironically, if you're going to choose, do you want to have the best hospital tech or the best GP tech in, in the world, you would choose GPs because a GP record is, is what's called a longitudinal record of your whole life. And that actually has what happened in hospital added into it, whereas a hospital record will just be of you know, one incident, your appendicitis or your hip being replaced or something like that. So that is why people often say that NHS um, IT system, NHS technology is a gold mine in terms of medical research, because we have very, very good records for 50 million people in a similar format that, you know, and we're the country that first discovered the link between lung cancer and smoking. We've had many extraordinary discoveries, but this, this has incredible potential. So there is some, some upside. I mean, you do talk about some extraordinary developments that you see happening pretty imminently in your conversations with uh, people who work in tech, particularly with being able to um, do blood samples and find out about diseases long before they've even, uh, we've even got symptoms. Yes, I mean, I think... You know, the mantra in, in health is that prevention is better than cure. And we are not very far away. I wouldn't be surprised if within a decade we are all sending a blood sample to a laboratory uh, once every six months. And one blood sample has about 300 biomarkers. And by looking at the changes in those biomarkers from the sample you sent six months earlier, or indeed by reference to other people in the population, you might well be able to spot bowel cancer before you have any symptoms at all. And there are some very exciting trials going on. Um, so I think, 
and you know, the other thing that's happening that's very interesting is the decoding of genomes, where you know, we, I think at one point in the pandemic, we were decoding half the genomes in the entire world, uh, half the COVID genomes that were being decoded in the entire world, which is why we became the place for identifying new variants. Um, so I think there's a, an opportunity for the NHS actually to leapfrog other countries and be the first country where, you know, if we said every baby that's born on the NHS will have a decoded genome sitting on their medical record, and doctors will be able to look at that record and say, um, not just this is what's happened to you, but these are the areas which you need to watch out for given your genetic profile. Lots of privacy issues to think about in all that, but it, it's potentially very exciting. I'm wary. I can see um, from your watch that my time of question answering, asking, um, is pretty much done. And I'm sure, given how many people... Yes, OK. I feel like we're going to have quite a few questions. Um, I hope that we can get through them all, but um, looks like, yes, going to be... OK. Two, two, Lots of questions. Yeah, let's take, um, let's take two at a time. You've got the microphone, so you go. Thank you so much for that conversation. I work in the NHS, I'll confess, um, and have done for over 20 years. And um, I'm interested in this book about patient safety, and patient safety is key. For a book produced about patient safety in the context of a pandemic, there was a whole ugly truth about our NHS, which was missing for me, which is the deaths caused by structural racism, in that black and brown people are killed disproportionately more, um, as, and that's a major patient safety issue. So the numbers that um, are that in the first wave of COVID, 96% of the doctors that died were black, Asian, and minority ethnic. Um, there's also data we've known for years about pregnancies. F black women die five times more when everything else is corrected for in pregnancy and birth than white women. Black babies die 50% more when they're cared for by white doctors, and that is eliminated if you have diverse teams. So I'm curious to know about your, your perspective on the intersection of structural racism, which is very present in the NHS and experienced on a daily basis with catastrophic consequences, and um, patient safety, because that's a major patient safety issue. Also, um, at, in the introduction, it was said that our community here at The Conduit, we have eight foundational principles, including racial equity and equity, diversity and inclusion. And I note that your patient safety watch um, board and your entire organization is made up of white men. And my perspective is that we know a lot about what diverse organizations, the benefits of diverse boards, and in my opinion, anything that's related to healthcare needs to have a diverse board. And we have excellent people within the conduit community who can help you with that. Um, so. Do, do you want to um, answer, answer those? And um, we'll take another one let, afterwards. Let us be of assistance to you. Uh, the third thing, sorry, I speak on behalf of many, is that um, Steve is probably the person who needs a signed copy of your book more than anybody else just now. And I hope that you and Sajid and Matt have invited him to the group chat um, because he's the one who's the custodian of this information now. So how are you going to support him for success? And um, how can we keep you accountable to that? Here, 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 here. I do have a question. Um, so... I'm an incoming doctor. I graduated this year, so I was the 2016 cohort that would have been at the advent of your mission to increase the number of trainee um, or medical students, I should say. Um, so um, I speak from the perspective of that, um, seeing that I'm about to embark on this journey of entering the NHS workforce. Um, you talked a lot about increasing the number of you know, people training particularly at the medical student level. But I was interested to sort of understand your thoughts as towards um, increasing training like further up the so-called hierarchy, which I know is, again, a, almost sort of an antithesis to your sort of philosophy. But thinking of there are many different funnel necks or silos, particularly at which um, different trainees are lost in the system due to frustration, due to lack of financial incentivization, due to stresses and other things that come from the awful like working hours. You want um, medical students who have seen this year the greatest number of people left on a reserve list without a guaranteed job for months on end to people trying to pursue a certain specialty who was taking years and years and years to get on that training ladder. I was just really curious to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. I think we'll... <laughs> okay. 
right. Okay. Um, two great questions. And so, first of all, um, I, when I was health secretary, um, obviously it was before the pandemic. Sorry, when I was health secretary, it was before the pandemic. At the select committee, we were very, very struck by the horrifying uh, greater likelihood of people from minority ethnic backgrounds dying from COVID and uh, particularly um, doctors and nurses and people working in the NHS. And we talk about that at length in our report. And I think uh, I don't, there is racism in the NHS. Um, it is also a much more progressive organization than many other organizations in Britain. And that's why I think Simon Stevens uh, uses the phrase that the NHS, when it comes to structural race, racism, is part of the problem and also part of the solution. And I do believe that because I think uh, the people who work in the NHS, the people I met, had very progressive views, but that doesn't mean that we don't have problems. I completely stand corrected. And thank you for pointing out about Patient Safety Watch, which is a very small patient safety charity. We do actually have uh, Claire Gerarda, who is um, a very distinguished doctor, whose quote is on the front cover, who is one of our advisors for Patient Safety Watch. Um, and, um, but she's not uh, minority ethnic. Um, and there are some people I can think of. Um, uh, Jackie Dunkley Bent, by the way, who's the chief midwife, is someone I've had many, many conversations with. But thank you for saying that. Uh, interestingly, the junior doctor's strike, although I talked about it as a nightmare, may have been responsible for your career because when I was trying to work out how I could end these strikes, um, I was I, looking at all the things the junior doctors were complaining about and I didn't agree with them about the contract, but they, they started talking about a lot of other things and the thing they talked about a lot was what they described as rotor gaps, going to work and finding that there were unfilled places on rotors. And I... Th I thought, actually, they've got a point. And then I started asking, you know, have we got enough doctors? And the answer came back, we do need more. And so that was why, at that time, Theresa May became Prime Minister. It was another day, a bit like today. And mm. the first big decision that I persuaded her to make on the NHS was to increase the number of doctor training places by 25%, which was, which was announced in 2016. I think probably you already started by then. Um, so... What, what we, there's lots of things we need to do to retain our doctor workforce. But I think the biggest single thing we could do for you is to give you hope that even though we don't have enough doctors in the workforce now, there is a plan in place to get enough doctors so that it's not going to be like this for your whole professional career and to give you some confidence. And we don't have that at the moment. I think we should have an independent assessment of whether we're training enough doctors and nurses for the future um, so that we can give you that, that confidence for the future. It's got a perfect mix of hope and scepticism on your face. Um, yes, if you, if you ask, ask yours and then we'll move, um, okay. move towards the back. Yeah. Um, I just sort of two relatively brief questions. Um, one is about, um, I'm actually trained as a doctor as well, but obviously you can tell from my accent, I didn't train here. And it was very, very difficult for me to become a consultant when I moved here. And like, so you're losing out, the NHS is losing out on the talents of a lot of physicians who move here, who then find it extraordinarily difficult to, quote, requalify to the point where a lot of people just give up. And these are people with loads of experience, you know, who could come in as consultant level. And it, the path is so long, you feel like you're starting over. And a lot of people just say, forget it. Um, the, other, the other thing which is related to that is I ended up becoming a management consultant focusing on the NHS because that was what I could do without taking 10 years to retrain. And it was interesting because you have a lot of people in management in the NHS who have no clinical training. You have a lot of people who are doing consulting work for the NHS who also have no understanding of how it works or how healthcare works, which is partly why I was brought on board. And so you sort of think, would it be helpful or would, you know, do you see a future in having more people in NHS management come from clinical backgrounds rather than business school? Yeah, should we take one? Let's take your question as well, and then Jeremy can answer them both after. OK. Um, without having read your book, I wanted to understand from you, Jeremy. Um, whether you think that throwing doctors at this problem is like 
just not a little bit short-sighted in terms of like how things work at scale. When we're talking about complexity, data points, continuous monitoring, um, surveillance of people in terms of their data points, like way before they enter that kind of GP room um, and see a specialist. It feels like it's easy to win popular support. We're saying we're gonna get more doctors in, but there's something actually fundamentally um, broken around that model of gatekeeping and how it could be disrupted and disintermediated by just a different, more equal way uh, of, of working. No, I'll do those. Okay, I'm going to do those in reverse order. Um, I, I don't think that we should say that a doctor has to be the clinician or the person who solves every problem. And if, if we do say that, we will never be able, we'll never have enough doctors. And doctors run are a part of clinical teams and it may well be that the right person to see you or solve a problem is a district nurse or a pharmacist um, or uh, you know a, a healthcare assistant but I do think that every NHS patient should have a doctor who is ultimately responsible for their care even if they're not personally delivering it I think it's very important in terms of accountability to know that there is someone who has been clinically trained who is keeping an eye on every person. And we lose out in both ways. We don't have enough doctors to do the care that can only be delivered by doctors, and we don't have that proper accountability, and I think we should change them both. I completely agree with you, sir, that we, we should, you know, we, we used immigration as a kind of get out of jail card uh, for not training enough doctors for the NHS for very many years. And we have brilliant doctors from overseas in the NHS. 24% of doctors are foreign-born. It would fall over without them. But I question the ethics of depending on developing countries for um, some of our supply of doctors because, you know, if someone like South Africa desperately needs doctors, I would never say that someone shouldn't be free to move to the NHS. I'd like international exchanges. But I think we've got to be careful of the impact on developing. Malawi, for example, opened its first medical school in the early 1990s. 500 doctors were trained in the first decade. Half of them left Malawi. And that is a really difficult challenge for a, for a low-income country. Where we know there's a country that has good medical training, a Canada, Australia, uh, probably the US, um, we should have a green list of countries and just say Germany, somewhere like that. We shouldn't make you resit all these exams over and over again. Um, and um, we, Margaret Thatcher introduced some reforms to try and wrest control of hospitals away from consultants who she thought were running it as vested interests. And she created, a, she, there was a report called the Griffiths Report, and she created a, a class of managers who are going to wrest control away from the doctors. And we do have some brilliant managers. I mean, David Dalton, one of the names I just mentioned to you, is one of those. He is brilliant. He's not a doctor. But doctors are you know, often, with respect, very high ego people, um, very capable people. And they often like being managed by another doctor. And it's harder to earn the re their respect if you're not a doctor. And I think it was a shame that we haven't tried to persuade more doctors to become managers and chief executives of hospitals, as happens in every other country in the world, because I think they could do it really well. I feel like every question so far, how many people in this room work for the NHS? <laughs> yeah, every question so far. So, um, and the, Hi. You, yes. Hi, so we, we've talked a lot about training more doctors and bringing in more doctors, and I think that's definitely part of the problem, but I don't think it's the only solution. And I'm wondering what you think we should do to try and retain doctors in the system. I talk as a former junior doctor when the strikes happened who now works outside of the system and gets two or three calls a day from sort of consultant colleagues who just are desperate to leave. I'd just be interested to hear your... That's a good question. And um, yes, someone... Has, you've already yes, got the sorry. mic. Yeah. Um, well, well, first of all, I'd say well done for doing what you're doing and actually talking about it. Um, I'm a former regional director of um, AstraZeneca, so I must, I must just say that. Uh, but I'm also a leadership and performance coach, an ex-KPMG life science. So I'm kind of in this field, but um, my question is, if you could answer it within the context of dentistry, because I'm actually working with some dentists, sort of young dentists, and I think there's a bit of a crisis in there. I'm not, I'm not a dentist, okay, but what I've noticed is that there's a report that 70% of them leave within four years and a lot of it's kind of mental. So I think there's a crisis at either end. So I'm thinking 
how can we bring, you mentioned about um, Jim Collins and good, great, you know, there's lots of great business principles out there, like OKRs and whatever we have, but black box thinking, you mentioned that. So my question is, in the context of dentistry, how do we bring the principles of great business into dentistry without it, it being turned into a business? And how do we um, get politics out of healthcare? Thank you. Can, can I say, and I've had my turn, but he's, there is a, I don't know if it's being addressed a crisis in dentistry, because if you want to get an NHS point, appointment for a dentist, no matter how dire the problem, you have to wait until September, sometimes the end of the year. I, I don't know how people are dealing with that. Yes. Um, so we've got big problems in dentistry. We've got, actually got, I think from memory, it's 3,000 more dentists than a few years ago, but a fall in the number of NHS dentists. And there is a particular issue with dentistry, which is the contract, the dental contract, which is based on something you'll know about, unit of dental activity, which means that dentists will get the same uh, payment for someone who has one filling to someone who has seven fillings. And it just doesn't work, and it needs to be scrapped. We need to start again. Um, and so that's one of the issues. And then you have all the other issues that we face with the doctors in terms of you know, training enough doctors. Brilliant question about how to retain doctors. And I've, I think this is absolutely right. It's not just about training more doctors. If the, um, you know, if, the, uh, if the plug isn't in the bottom of the bath, then you can put the taps on as much as you like and the water's still going to drain away. And that's what's happening. Um, I think the issue... So I famously promised to have 5,000 more GPs by 2020. Um, in 2015, and when I left three years later, I hadn't got to the 2020, we only had 300 more, so we'd made negligible progress. And, but I didn't promise 5,000 GPs you know, plucked out of the air. My officials said, we can deliver 5,000 more GPs, and it's safe for you to promise this, Secretary of State. But a big increase in the number of GPs who came into the market as new GPs decided to work part-time, um, and not full-time, and then we had a big increase in people retiring early. And I think the, the biggest single thing, which is not just GPs, is that we, we need to make it much, much easier for people to work flexibly. At the moment, the only way to work flexibly, is, or main way really, is to be a locum, and that means that you don't have sustained ongoing relationships with patients because you're moving from place to place, and that's really... One of, I think one of the main things about being a doctor, not that I am one, is to have that ongoing relationship with patients. So um, I think having more flexible working would help retain doctors who are perhaps having a family in their 30s and also doctors who are in their 50s and might want to work a little bit less but not retire completely. That, I think we could, we could have a real revolution in flexible working. There's a question here. Let's take two. Let's take yes. Two. Okay. Um, firstly, I'm curious how you think the NHS compares to other large public health systems in Europe, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, etc. Just roughly, but where do you think the NHS could become a benchmark and where do you think they're playing catch up? Okay. And then secondly, uh, in Germany this year, 60% of the incumbent class of medical doctors are women. That's because the selection is made on grades at high school and women are smarter, so they get <laughs> um, Which So we can expect in eight years from now, 60% of medical, new medical doctors to be women. Do you see the same thing happening in the UK and NHS? And if so, that would actually change very much uh, the rules of the game, I think. Thank you. Um, first of all, just want to say thank you for um, the, the, the talk and also the content of the book. So during the period while you were uh, Secretary of State for Health, I worked within health and social care regulation. So I saw a number of the issues that um, you've talked about here and, and was involved in trying to come up with responses to it. And I saw what happened at mid-staffs. So I saw the tragedy that happened at baby, with Baby P in the social uh, care sector. Um, but one of the things that isn't in your book, um, and one of the inquiries that you set up which you didn't mention, um, was the inquiry into the um, behaviour of Ian Patterson, which for people who aren't aware of that in the audience was a major 
probably the largest patient safety scandal that's ever hit the UK, where thousands of thousands of mainly female patients um, were often told they had cancer and when they didn't, operated on, had their breasts and other um, organs removed. Um, the inquiry which you um, set up um, reported uh, a number of years ago, the recommendations that were made by the inquiry um, were, pu were pushed mainly by patients, again, another kind of aspect of the way in which these things change, and yet nothing has happened. Nothing has happened in that sector. Okay. And I think you'll also probably remember um, your letter to the private hospital sector, I think, in 2018, after the death of Peter O'Donnell, where you wrote to the private hospital sector telling the hospital sector to get it it's a uh, house in order on patient safety. So, sorry, my question is this. What is the impediment that you experienced to seeing change in those areas where you saw change in all the various other areas that um, you worked on? Um, okay, um, thank you. Well, look, two, two great questions. How do we compare to other healthcare systems? It's very, um, it's a difficult one because countries collect data in different ways. Uh, but cancer outcomes are better in France and Germany and uh, Denmark and Australia than they are here. And, um, and that's something that worries me a lot. The NHS tends to do better than nearly anywhere else on things like childhood vaccination take-up. So we have very strong public health traditions. And... Um, but as I mentioned, we uh, don't have as many doctors per head as many of those European countries, and that, I think, does have an impact on patient safety and the quality of care. But I don't think that we need to change the way we fund the NHS to address those issues, and I think it would be an enormous distraction to do that, um, and we'd end up having a huge argument about it for years and years and not actually getting on with... Uh, making sure we do have as many doctors per head as France or Germany, which we can perfectly easily do in our, in our current system. Um, and I do think that the NHS is the most transparent healthcare system in the world when it comes to patient safety. We talk more about these issues than anywhere else in the world, and we're certainly not the only country that has these issues. And, so I, and I think that transparency is, is absolutely uh, laudable. Um, the Ian Patterson case is a very good point, actually. I don't know why I should have talked about that. Um, this is a, a rogue surgeon who did the most appalling things, as you, as you described. And one of the main ways he got away with it is because he often did these operations in the private sector, and there was a kind of loophole where the private sector assumed that he was a good surgeon, and they didn't need to keep an eye on him because he was also an NHS consultant. They assumed the NHS would be doing that. So that I wrote that stiff letter to really tell the private sector that they need to share their data on uh, surgeon outcomes with the NHS data. We need to have one national database because our surgeons often practice in both. Now, I will follow this up after tonight, but my understanding is that that is in the process of happening if it hasn't already happened. Um, you may know better than me, but... Professor Sir Norman Williams was, was behind trying to make that happen, but I, I will look into it. We probably do then have time to sneak in maybe that one question, but very, very quickly, if, if you can, just got a, a minute left. Okay, um, thank you very much for tonight, uh, Jeremy. I'm a former banker turned health sec entrepreneur, so I'm coming from a different uh, lens. But given we all are aware of many of the issues, systemic issues that are present, uh, I'm all about moonshot goals, but which, what do you actually hope to achieve from this book? And which of your you know, goals do you actually really believe can realistically be handled? Okay, it's a great question to end on. Um, because, and I, I'll, I, I'm going to put it, I'm going to say it like this, because you talked, Hannah, about 1948 moment. So the, the great vision of 1948, which is why we've taken the NHS to our heart, is that we're all proud to be in a country where rich or poor, young or old, city or country, you can get the health care you need. But we, for a long time, defined that as not having to wait too long to see a GP or to get an operation. And the central argument I want to make in this book is for that vision to be true, the quality and safety of care has to be as good in the NHS as you would get in any private system um, anywhere in the world. Because that's the vision. It's not that 
you can just access any old health care. It's that you can access good quality health care. And we do actually have fantastic quality health care in the NHS, but it's patchy. It's not consistent. We've got some of the best hospitals in the world within a mile of where we are right now. And we've got some you know, lousy hospitals in London. I won't say which ones, but you can all look at the CQC ratings because it's all, it's all out there. And I think that if we believe in that founding vision of the NHS, what's the goal? It's to say that we're going to not just be proud of the access that we offer to healthcare, but also it's going to be the safest, highest quality healthcare any, anywhere in the world. And I really think we can do that. Um, and, and that's really what I try and suggest how we get there in the book. Um, yeah, well, dropping okay. the answer. Um, we have to let Jeremy get back onto his actual bike, and I'm not sure, very busy, probably week, weeks unfold. Um, but thank you very, very much for taking the time to come this evening, and thank you to all of you, and thanks for brilliant questions, and sorry for those I didn't get to. Thank there, you. There are a few signed copies around, and, uh, um, and uh, all profits go to charity. Patient Safety Watch, in fact. Thank you. <laughs>